All right, so now we're gonna do a quick review. It goes through the paper as fast as possible. October, November 2008, paper 9702, paper 4. So this is basically an A2 paper, winter 2008, paper 4. All right, let's start. So the first question is spherical planet of mass m and radius r. All right, so this is a gravitational field question, and most possibly it also has circular motion in it. It's pretty obvious. Planet may be assumed to be isolated sphere in space, has a mass concentrated at the center. The planet spins on its axis angular speed omega, as illustrated in figure 1.1. All right, so this is pretty much easy. It's a straightforward question. State the formula. State formula in terms of m, m, r, and omega 4, the gravitational force between the planet and the object. All right, so this one, this one's pr pretty much straightforward. What you have to do here is uh, you just show that the force of attraction between the two masses is going to be a certain value. And as we know, this follows a very simple formula. It's going to be F is equal to G, uh, capital G, small m, capital M, by R square. That's it. Really simple, straightforward. So there you go. That's the answer to the first one. Tapper. Uh, the centripetal force required a circular motion of a small mass. So the centripetal force required by a small mass, which is going to be basically the mass m, rests on the equator of the planet. So this is going to follow circular motion, where r is uh, the circumference, sorry, the radius over which it's going to spin. So that will have a radius of how much? That will have a radius of how much? R. So what would be your equation? It's going to be very simple. F is equal to mR omega squared. So yeah, that's how you solve this one. All right, next question. No reactant force exerted by the planet on the mass. All right, so here what you have to take in notice is that the object is going through circular motion. What is the mass? So for that, you have to have a resultant force acting on it towards the center of the circle. So for that to happen, and the reaction force has to be less than weight. It can't be equal to the weight. If it's equal to the weight, then the object will not be moving along a circle. It will be moving along a straight line, or it will be at rest. So as we already established, it's going around along the equator. There is an acceleration, which means there's a resultant force. How much is this resultant force going to be? Obviously, it's equal to the centripetal force, right? So the difference between uh, the reaction force and weight has to be the central force. So if we just follow this basic concept and try to answer the question, what do we get? The reaction force has to be equal to basically the difference between the two. So the previous two equations, which was capital G, capital M, small m, by R square minus uh, M R square omega. So same equations, this equation and this equation, the difference between the two. That gives you the reaction force exerted by the planet on the mass. All right. Uh, we can move on to the next question. Explain why the normal reaction force in the mass has different values at the equator and the poles. All right, this is a pretty good question and actually it's fairly common. So what are they saying? They're saying that the reaction force varies, all right? So what causes the reaction force to vary? The fact that it's going to act at two different points, the forces will differ. So in this case, what um, if we do a little bit of drawing here, we see that when an object is on the equator, it creates a circle which is basically this much. And this circle has a certain orbit. How much is the orbit? It is r. As you move towards the poles, the circle that the object rotates around becomes smaller. The radius becomes smaller progressively. And eventually at the poles, what happens is uh, it is no longer going around in a circle. It's just spinning at one point. So if that is the case, then that basically means what? That the radius progressively decreases. And as the radius decreases, the object uh, actually doesn't go through circular motion anymore. So if that is the case, so if we go back to the formula that we used, mR omega square, then what happens is the circular, uh, the centripetal force here gradually drops to zero because F is equal to mR omega square, and here we end up having no force. So F is equal to mR omega square is the same stuff again. So R is progressively decreasing as you move. Here, if we draw the axis, this is R, which is maximum at the equator, and this progressively decreases and then drops to zero here. So under such circumstances, R will be equal to zero, and hence the reaction force will decrease. Sorry, uh, the centripetal force required will decrease. And if that is the situation, what this results in is a change in the reaction force. So to answer this, what would you have to say? You'll basically have to say that uh, in mR omega squared, there is R, which is basically the radius of the circle made by the object. And as, it, as you move towards the pole, uh, the, uh, the value of R decreases. The, the required centripetal force becomes smaller and smaller, and is eventually zero at the pole. Hence, 
the reaction force will be less. Another way you can explain this is if you consider the force acting from here, you would see that the gravitational force of attraction would, uh, say for example this point, the force of attraction is going to be acting like this and the reaction force is going to, the centripetal force is going to be acting along this plane. So what happens is only at the equator they're actually perpendicular opposite to each other, but eventually this decreases and eventually once you reach the pole, uh, the central force obviously drops to zero and uh, even if you don't, even before that, what you have is the gravitational force of attraction is acting towards the center while this force is yet along this plane. So that's the reason. All right, moving forward to the next question. The radius of the planet is 6.410 power 6 meters. It completes one revolution 8.610 power 4 seconds. Calculate the magnitude of central force at uh, central acceleration at the equator. For this, it's very straightforward. At the equator, obviously, the radius is going to be 6.410 power 6. So acceleration A is equal to omega square R. So if that is the case, what is going to be omega? If it's 8.610 power 4 seconds, then uh, omega is equal to 2 pi by t. So if it's 2 pi by t, then what would you get? 2 pi divided by 8.6 times 10 to the power 4. That's omega. So we square this omega squared into r, which is 6.4 times 10 to the power 6. If you do the calculation correctly, your answer will be 0 0.034 meters per second squared. So we can unit do this. We don't have to talk about that unit anymore. All right, the next question. Uh, completes one revolution, 8.6, blah, blah, blah. Calculate the magnitude of acceleration at the poles. So if we consider the poles, this actually doesn't have any calculation because the radius is zero. So m, uh, sorry, omega square r, the value of r is zero. So acceleration is zero. Simple as that. All right, then. So just two factors that could, in case of real planet, cause variations in acceleration of the free fall of a source. All right, for any planet, we can consider that the planet is not a perfect sphere, so the radius can vary. <coughs> that can consider trenches, hills, mountains, or even the fact that the planet is not perfectly round. Also, another fact that could be that the density of the planet varies from different regions. So you can also say that basically geographical or topological reasons. So you say you can say that the radius is not constant or the density is the radius varies or the density is not constant throughout the planet. Also, another point is just we just calculated that uh, the acceleration free fall will vary based on where you are on the planet. Because if you're close to the equator, acceleration free fall will be less because the reaction force acting on you will be less. While at the poles, the acceleration free fall will be more because you're no longer moving along the path of a circle. So that's another reason, because the planet is basically spinning. And uh, another reason could be that if you have nearby other masses like stars or other planets, this can cause a very minute but uh, possible change in the value of free fall. All right, these are the answers that they would accept for this. Let's move on to the next question. Specific latent heat of fusion, you guys know this. It is the energy required to convert unit mass of solid to liquid uh, without any change in temperature. Simple as that. We won't go into any more detail in that regard. All right, the next question. Some ice is crushed. At, uh, crushed ice at 0 degrees Celsius is placed in a form together with electric heater as shown. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So basically what happens? Let's read through the next part carefully. The mass of the water is collected in a beaker in a measured interval of time is determined uh, with the heater switched off. All right, so when they're doing this without the heater on, that's basically melting due to uh, the surrounding temperature and everything, atmospheric thermal energy. Uh, the mass is then, found, uh, is then found when the heater is switched on. The energy supplied to the heater is also measured. For both measurements, the mass of the mass, water is not collected until the melting occurs at the constant rate. So heater is switched off. So you get 16.6 grams of water, which is melted. So obviously this is due to thermal energy from the surroundings. Heater switched on 64.7. State why the mass of the water was determined with the heater switched off. So it's basically the answer that we just said is basically make allowance uh, due to heat gains from the atmosphere. All right, then the next question says, so how can we determine that the ice is melting at a constant rate? That's very easy. A logical method is to see the rate of, at which the drops are falling. So if you see that the, uh, the drops are falling at a constant rate, you can consider that it's melting constantly. And another method is you just see how much mass is increasing per unit time, say every 15 seconds or every 30 seconds or every one minute. If you see that the increase in mass is constant, then you can consider that the melting is at a constant rate. Calculate a value for the specific latent heat of fusion of ice. So how are you going to do this? It's very easy. What you do is step one you have to find out how much of the ice melted due to the heater only. So you have to be very careful here. This, the, in this question, when the heater was switched off, it was switched off for 10 minutes. So 16.6 grams over a time period of 10 minutes. So that's basically how much? That's 8.3 grams in 5 minutes. Because we have, within another 5 minutes, 64.7 grams. So what would we do? First of all, we have to calculate the total mass uh, which melted. 64.7 minus uh, 8.3 that should give you 56.4 grams. 
All right, then you use uh, the equation for specific latent heat diffusion, Q is equal to ML. In this case, it's going to be 18 kilojoules. So you can say 18,000 uh, is equal to M, which is going to be uh, 56.4 grams into uh, the latent heat of uh, a specific latent heat diffusion of ice. So if you do this calculation, if we consider the kilojoules and the grams and everything, and we convert it, you're going to get L as a value of 320 kilojoules per kg. And we have to convert it to kilojoules and kg because the answer expects it as such. All right. A needle or sewing machine is made to oscillate vertically through a total distance of 22 millimeters. So this is an SHM question, very straightforward. Oscillations are simple harmonic motion frequency of 4.5 hertz. The cloth is being sewn at is positioned uh, 8 millimeters below the point of the needle when the needle is at maximum height. All right. So before we get into this question, let's get into a little bit of explanation of what's exactly happening here. So if it moves over a total distance of 22 millimeters, that means that is the distance from the highest point to the lowest point of its oscillation, which means if we were to draw an SHM graph based on this, uh, this would be the midline of the 22 millimeters and it would move as such. So that means the highest point would be, say, uh, plus 11 millimeters and the lowest point would be minus 11 millimeters. How did we figure this out? Because it moves over a total distance of 22 millimeters. So if we take this at the midpoint here, it's showing that it has its maximum height. The cloth is being soon... Uh, the cloth that is being sewn is positioned 8 millimeters below the point where the needle, when the needle is at its maximum height. So if it's at its maximum height, which is here, it would move down over a total distance of 22 millimeters. So if it's 8 millimeters, if it was at its midpoint, basically with zero displacement, where it would be, it would move by 11 millimeters down. So it moves 11 millimeters down from 8 millimeters, you'd end up at how much? minus 3 millimeters. Basically, you'd be under the cloth by 3 millimeters. And if it were to move to its lowest point, it would move by a further 11, you'd be at minus 14 millimeters. The minus isn't important. The important fact is that you know that the minus represents uh, it's beneath the cloth. We're considering this as 8 millimeters and at the cloth we're considering it at 0 millimeters. The question does not specifically ask it in this manner, but it is easier to understand it like this, the plus and the minus. Anyway, so yeah, let's move forward with this question. Let's see what they want. State what is meant by simple harmonic motion, very easy, definite simple harmonic motion. Uh, so basically, um, the acceleration is proportional to the displacement from the fixed point and the acceleration is always in the direction of the fixed point. All right, next, the displacement y of the point of the needle may be represented by the equation y is equal to a cos omega t. All right, so the question here is why are they using a cos, a cos equation when we know that sine omega t is usually used? That's because it's starting from the highest point. So if you draw a cos graph, cos graphs usually start from the highest point. So that's why... In this case, a cos graph is relevant. If if they did start it from here at minus 3 millimeters, then we could use a sine graph and we could say a is equal to y is equal to a sine omega t. So that's why a cos graph is suitable at this point. All right. Suggest so the position of the of the point of the needle at time is equal to zero. So obviously the equation is saying it's at its highest point because it's a cost equation. So it's obviously going to be at which point? It's going to be the highest point, which is basically 8 millimeters above the cloth. And uh, yeah, that's it. Simple as that. There you go. Determine the values of A and omega. All right. A is going to be the uh, the amplitude of the displacement. And as we talked about it here, 22 millimeters above and below. So it's going to be half of that, which is 11 millimeters. The highest because plus maximum amplitude is going to be up here. And the lowest point is going to be 22 millimeters underneath that point. So the midpoint of this is the equilibrium point. So we have 11 millimeters. All right. Second, omega. So how are we going to do the calculation for omega here? Uh, basically, we can use the equation 2, uh, 2 pi f. So if we use 2 pi f, they've already given us the equation, uh, the information that the frequency is 4.5 hertz. Really easily done, 2 pi into 4.5, and your answer should be 28.3 radian per second. All right, then we can move on to the next question. Calculate the, for the point of the needle, its maximum speed. So for this question, what we can do is, so we can use the equation, uh, v is equal to x naught omega, where x naught is basically the amplitude and omega is the angular speed. So you can take 28, uh, sorry, that's the omega value. So we can take the amplitude as 11 times 10 to the power minus 3. We're basically converting the displacement into meters into omega, which is 28.3. So your uh, velocity is going to be 0 0.31 meters per second. You have to be aware of that again. That's why we'll have to do it like that. Next question. Its speed 
as it moves downwards through the cloth. So, all right. So, when they mean through the cloth, they're basically trying to ask you what is its displacement from its equilibrium point. So, we figured out that the equilibrium point is minus 3, or basically 3 millimeters beneath the cloth. How did we come up with that? Because the equilibrium point, it's moving, it's at its highest point here. If you move down by 11 millimeters, it's going to be at its equilibrium. 8 millimeters moving down takes you to minus 3. So, when it passes through the cloth, it's from its equilibrium position by 3 millimeters. That's the thing that they want you to use your brains to figure out. So, once you have that figured out, then the next thing you can do is uh, you can uh, you can figure out how much it's going to be, the speed as it moves through the cloth. So, how do you do that? You can use the equation. Uh, there's one equation that we can use specifically for displacement. Uh, that's going to be V is equal to omega root over x naught square minus x square, right? So, where x naught is your amplitude and x is the displacement from the equilibrium point. So, here, omega is going to be 28.3. Uh, we're going to use 28.3 uh, times 10 to the power minus 3. And uh, x naught is going to be basically 11. And amplitude is uh, amplitude is 11. And th that is going to be 3. So you end up getting 0.3. Write down an equation to represent the first law of thermodynamics. I'm pretty sure you guys know this already. Um, basically, the gain in internal energy of a system is equal to the energy given to it by heating it, plus the internal energy uh by working on it. So it's going to be del U is equal to Q plus W. It's a really easy question, no brainer. The pressure of an ideal gas is decreased at constant temperature. Explain what change, if any, occurs in the internal energy of the gas. All right. So what you have to bear in mind here is that they mention that the gas is an ideal gas. So one of the properties of an ideal gas is that there are no intermolecular forces of attraction. All right. So if there are, not, there are no intermolecular forces of attraction, there is no basically any, basically no intermolecular uh, potential energy. So there is no molecular potential energy between the particles. So the only energy that the gas does have is molecular kinetic energy. So on that basis you can say that the kinetic energy is constant. How do we know this? Because it's at a constant temperature. So this is based on the equation uh, half m c square is equal to 3 by 2 kT. So basically if the temperature is constant, the kinetic energy of the particles are constant without any doubt. So basically you can say here that the kinetic energy is constant because the temperature is constant and the potential energy is zero because there are no intermolecular forces. All right. So basically there is no change in the internal energy as the uh, pressure of the ideal gas is decreased. Two, uh, two deuterium uh, nuclei are traveling to, uh, directly towards one another when the separation is large compared to the diameters. They each have a speed v as illustrated in figure 5.1. So uh, let's see, the diameter of deuterium nucleus is this. Using energy considerations show that the initial speed V of the deuterium nuclei must be approximately this in order that they may come in contact. All right, so we're talking about two deuterium nuclei, and this is a question where, we're, where they're specifically asking you to figure out something based on electrical repulsion, electrostatic forces. How? Because this is a positive charge, and this is another positive charge, and you're causing them to reach a point where they actually meet. So that means they have to overcome their electrostatic forces of repulsion and for that they have to overcome a certain amount of electric potential. So whenever they say explain your working you have to be specific about uh, what sort of concept it is you're using. So the first thing that you should write in such questions is that um, the gain in the electric potential energy. Gain in electric potential energy is equal to the loss of the particle's kinetic energy, right? So then you can just do very easily, because we're talking about two particles, we have to take the consideration of the total kinetic energy of the particles. So uh, that basically we use the equation for potential. So it's going to be Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R, right? So it's going to be Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R, where Q is the charge of one of the uh, nuclei into Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R and this is equal to the kinetic energy of this plus the kinetic energy of that so it's going to be half mv square plus half mv square so we can consider that uh, like you know it's the same charge the same mass and everything so we can reduce this and write it in a, in its simplified version as uh, mv square is equal to Q square by 4 pi epsilon naught R all right so uh, here, one thing that you have to be aware of is the separation, the value of R. So they've given you that the deuterium nucleus has a diameter of this. So that, that's basically the total distance from one end to the other. What we need is the radius of this and the radius of this, which is basically equal to the value of the diameter. This is how close they will come once they come in contact with each other. 
it's going to be basically equal to the diameter. So if you uh, if you use the, these values, uh, basically you're going to end up getting an equation which is basically half into um, mass of one of the particles, which is 1.67 times 10 to the power minus 27, the nucleons basically, uh, into two because it's deuterium, and uh, multiply this with v squared. And given that you put the values in properly, you should get and basically r, so r is going to be the two radii, so it's basically equal to the diameter, and your value is going to be 2.5 times 10 to the power 6 meters per second. So that's going to be your answer. All right, now we can move on to the next question. All right, the next question. For a fusion reaction to occur, deuterium nuclei must come in contact. Assuming the deuterium nuclei behaves as an ideal gas, which means we can use the equations for ideal gases here, right? Deduce a value for the temperature of the deuterium such that the RMS speed is equal to the speed calculated in A. So yeah. What we have to do is we have to use the equations for uh, kinetic energy of the particles and we also have to use uh, something which works with ideal gases and temperature. So we can put together two equations. The two equations we're going to use is PV is equal to um, 1 half nmc square c square and another equation that we can use is PV is equal to nkt. So if we equate the two we get the equation half mc square is equal to 3 by 2 kT. And then we put in the values where m is going to be 1.67 times 10 to the power 27 times 2, basically the mass of each nucleon, into c squared, um, which is basically the speed that we just calculated, which is going to be 2.5 to the power 6 squared, equal to 3 by 2 into 1.3 1, 1 times 10 to the power 23 into t. So the value of t should come as 5 into 10 to the power 8 Kelvin. That's going to be your answer. All right, then we can move on to the next question. Comment on your answer in B. So the temperature that we got, 5 times 10 to the power 8 Kelvin, that is an extremely high temperature. It's, it doesn't happen anywhere, right? In nowhere on the planet Earth will you get these such temperatures. The only place where you actually will get these temperatures is in the core of stars. So in the cores of stars, you end up getting this temperature because that's where we have these fusion processes occurring. All right, we can move on to the next question. So this is a transformer, we're talking about electromagnetic induction, suggest why the core is a continuous loop. That's very easy, it's a very obvious question. That is to ensure that the flux lines created by the primary coil passes through the secondary coil. And uh, you can say that, or you can say that it prevents loss of the magnetic flux, or you can say the flux linkage with the secondary is better. Any of these points work. Why is it laminated? All right, let's just talk a little bit about lamination here. So basically, lam lamination here specifically means that these particle, that uh, the transformer is broken along its width as slices. So basically, it's like sliced along this line, sliced all the way along here into sheets. So what happens is it prevents current flow along this axis. And when would we get current flow along this axis in the soft iron core? It is due to eddy currents due to the magnetic field passing through it. So if we laminate it, basically break it into split, uh, split it into sheets and then give plastic layers in between them, what would happen is it would prevent, uh, it would prevent energy loss because uh, it prevents current flow through it. So your answer should be that it reduces. What you must mention, it reduces uh, we, because it won't completely prevent it actually. So it reduces their energy loss due to eddy current. So yeah, that's your answer. There you go. Very simple, straightforward answer. Why it's laminated. State Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. Everyone knows this. Induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change of magnetic flux linkage. All right. Use Faraday's law to explain the operation of a transformer. A three mark question. This can vary over a certain number of marks. Let me give you a couple of points. So basically, the primary coil has an alternating current. So a changing or an alternating current in the primary coil causes an alternating or changing magnetic flux in the iron core. That's how you answer this. That's so you have two marks there. Then, uh, when the flux lines pass through the secondary coil, it causes a flux linkage through it. And the changing flux linkage through the secondary coil induces an EMF in it. That's it. That's the points that you have to write for here. State two advantage of using alternating voltage for transmission and use of electrical energy. Um, uh, basically, the number one main reason that we use transformers is to decrease power loss, right? Line loss. How do we do that? We increase the voltage, uh, step up transformers, which decrease the current and hence uh, eliminates the amount of energy loss. And the second point is basically it's the same concept as this, which is that it is very easy to transform or vary voltages from, uh, from any value. If you want to move it up or move it down, transformers are the best way to do it. All right. So that's that. These are the two points for this answer. 
Then moving forward, state three pieces of evidence provided by the photoelectric effect for a particular nature of electromagnetic radiation. So obviously this is a this is a question based on um, quantum physics. So there are very common. This is a very common question. They love asking this one. So the number one thing that you can say uh, the particulate nature is the concept of instantaneous emission. So the concept of instantaneous emission is there is no delay between uh, the uh, the light, the photons, basically light touching the metal and emission of electrons. If it was wave theory, then there would be some sort of delay. Even if it was very small, there should be some sort of delay. That's point number one. Point number two that you can mention is that there is a pressure, presence of a threshold frequency, which shouldn't be there if you have the wave theory. After enough delay, you at any frequency, you should have emission, which doesn't occur, which means there's uh, something up with that. So there's a presence of a threshold frequency. You can talk about that also. Another thing that you can say is that the energy that the electrons have, its maximum kinetic energy, is not dependent on the intensity, and instead it is dependent on the frequency, right? So you can write that. And another point, a fourth point, if you do want to mention it, you can say that the rate at which emit, em, emitted electrons occur, money, emission of electrons occur, it uh, depends not on the frequency, it depends instead on the intensity. So you can write any of these points for this. Briefly describe the concept of a photon. So a photon is basically a packet of energy of the electromagnetic spectrum or electromagnetic radiation. That's it. And you can, if there's more marks, you can also say that the energy is proportional to the frequency, E is equal to HF. Explain how lines in the emission spectrum of gases at low pressure provide evidence of discrete energy, electron energy levels in atoms. That's it. So for here, what you have to do is you have to visualize the energy levels. So say we have energy levels. It's because we have these fixed levels. When electrons drop from one to the next level, it causes emission of photons. So these photons will have very discrete energy level, uh, discrete um, wavelengths. So these wavelengths refer to a specific frequency, and this is basically why we get lines. If we didn't have specific values, we wouldn't get lines. You'd get regions, or like, you know, you have a blurry region of a specific color, and then a gap, then another blurry region of a specific color. We're not getting this. What we are getting, actually, are fixed lines, which represents this, this one exact frequency which is released, which means that the change in energy is also an exact value, a discrete value. So basically, this is what you have to mention here. So what are the points you mentioned? Discrete wavelengths mean photons have particular energies, all right? So the photons, because we know that uh, energy of a photon e is equal to hc by lambda. So fixed lambda means that the energy is also fixed for the photon. All right, that's what you have to mention. And the energy of the photon is determined when? Based on the change of the jump of the electrons. I, money. Usually the electrons are released, uh, photons are released when electrons drop from a higher energy level to a lower energy level. Hence, this proves that there must be discrete energy levels present. All right, then we can move on to the next question. Three electron energy levels of atomic hydrogen represented in 7.1. So these are the levels. These are not the changes. We'll talk about the changes in a bit. The three wavelengths of the spectral lines produced by the electron transitions between these energy levels, 486, 656, and 1180 nanometers. All right. Before they even ask a question, I'd like to start drawing stuff here. So these are basically wavelengths of the photons released. So if we go back to the equation E is equal to hc by lambda, what we do see that the energy is inversely proportional to the wavelength. So the longer wavelengths means it has lower energy, and the shorter wavelengths means it has higher energy. When will you get higher energy? When the jump is a large one. So as you drop from the highest, the largest difference you have, this will have a wavelength of 486 nanometers. All right. Then we have, uh, this is the largest jump. The next jump that we could possibly have is this. And the next jump would be this. So this is the smallest possible jump, as it seems, because the energy levels are representative. The gap between them represents the amount of energy. So this would have the longest wavelength, which is 1880 nanometers. And the largest gap that we have is 656 nanometers. So based on this, this is how we have these different energy levels. On figure 7.1, draw arrows to show the electron energy transitions between the energy levels that would give rise to these wavelengths. All right, they're saying give rise to these wavelengths, which means that these energies are released. So these are basically falls, right? So if we, if we were to consider specific falls of the electrons, so what would we have? Basically this, this, and this. These are the three faults. If they said absorption, then the absorptions would obviously be this, then it would be this, then it would be this. So these cause emission, and these are caused when electrons absorb the energy. All right, so there you go. Label each arrow with the wavelength of the emitted photon, which we just did. So the smallest one will have the longest wavelength, which is 1880. 
the largest one will have the shortest wavelength which is 486 and the medium one will have 656 nanometers as its wavelength there you go then the next question states calculate the maximum energy change change in energy of an electron when making transitions between these energy levels so that's uh, basically what you do is uh, after all of this what we can understand is that the shortest wavelength will have the highest energy which is 486 nanometers so you put it into the equation e is equal to 8c by lambda right the equation that i just wrote so 8c by lambda so if you do this calculation properly if you take Planck's constant 6.63 times 10 to the power 34 times c the speed of light 3 times 10 to the power 8 you divide it by this value 486 times 10 to the power minus 9 your answer to this value should be 4.09 it should be 4.09 times 10 to the power minus 19 joules. All right. So there you go. The next question. Describe what is meant by a magnetic field. Very simple, straightforward question. It is a region of space in which a force is experienced by, you can mention a kind kind conductor, or you can say a moving charge, or you can say a permanent magnet. These are all things which have their own magnetic fields. What are they? Kind kind conductor, moving charge, and permanent magnet. All right. Then, question B. Small mass is placed in a field of force, either electric mag or magnetic, gravitational. All right. Electric or magnetic or gravitational. These are the three that they're talking about here. So we have to figure out state the nature of the field force produced if the mass is all right charged and the force is opposite to the direction of the field so we have a charge which is experiencing a force opposite to the direction of the field so this is basically what opposite so it's an electron experiencing a force opposite to the direction of the field lines so that is basically an electric field uncharged and the force in the direction of the field so the moment we go into uncharged we're pretty sure it has nothing to do with electric neither does it have anything to do with magnetic so it's obviously gravitational this is electric and the next one is gravitational charged and there is a force only when the mass is moving so this is basically based on f is equal to bqv moving charges causes a magnetic field to be generated which interacts with other magnetic fields so this is magnetic charged and there is no force in the mass when it is stationary or moving in a particular direction all right or moving in a particular direction so basically they're talking about a situation where if the particle is moving say parallel to the magnetic field uh, so it won't have any effect on it. So in this case, this is also a magnetic field. All right. So that's the answer to this one. Then we can move on to the next question. Infrared radiation rather than visible light is usually used in optic fibers. All right. The reason of this is because one of the things that you learn in communication is that if the wavelength increases, uh, it causes the, uh, the attenuation to decrease. Basically, energy is lost slower. So the answer that you write for two marks here is that infrared has less attenuation per unit length because it's longer wavelength, and hence you will need to amplify it less, frequency, less frequently. So you can have a longer uninterrupted length of uh, fiber optic cables. All right. Base stations in mobile phones, network operate in UHF. This is no longer in the syllabus. But if you want to know, it's basically due to uh, maintaining a limited range. The higher the frequency, the shorter the range. It's opposite to this. So this causes uh, the cellular network to be uh, designed, basically where you have separate cells. In each cell, you have a certain frequency and it's over a limited range. So it's, it's also convenient uh, to have short antennas in cell phones. All right, you don't really need to know this one. For the satellite communication, for satellite communication, frequencies in order gigahertz is used to the uplink and having different frequencies in downlink. So yeah, this is something that uh, we need to know. The concept is known as swamping. If you read the application booklet or even if you read your text, you'll come across it. Swamping. So swamping is basically when uh, you have a satellite and the satellite experiences uh, confusion due to the signals it generates by itself. The signals which come from Earth say they, they're very weak by the time they reach the satellite. If they have the same frequency as the signals it boosts down, then these can actually overpower the incoming signals and the satellite will no longer be able to pick up which one is its own signal and which one is being sent from Earth. So the best thing to do is the frequency of this will be higher, the, uh, the, the signal coming from Earth. And the downlink, the signal which is going down, will have a frequency which is lower. So usually these are two-thirds ratios. For example, if the uplink is 30 gigahertz, then the downlink is going to be 20. So we have a 30-20. Or we can have, uh, say, 14-11 or 14-12. And also we could have uh, 9 and 6. 
So basically these are the uplinks and these are the downlinks. This is to prevent the frequencies to be the same, hence interfering and swamping out the uplink. And the frequencies in the order of gigahertz are used. So basically you have to mention this first, why are we using gigahertz frequencies? And that's because satellite communication usually has a huge amount of information going, so you need a large bandwidth, so that's one point. Uh, with the uplink, having a different frequency to the downlink. So why do they have a different frequency? So it is not swamped, simple as that. All right, we can move on to the next question. So this is an operational amplifier question on op amp shown in figure 10.1, uh, R2, R1. Name this type of amplifier circuit. How can we identify this? If you notice, the non-inverting input is earth and the inverting input has B into it after resistance. So this is obviously an inverting amplifier. All right. Why point P is referred to virtual earth? This is a question they love asking all the time. So it's usually a three mark question. And the reason is basically we don't want the output to be saturated, but an op amp has a really high gain, right? So this is going to multiply any difference between them by a huge amount, so by 10 to the power 5, or like, you know, almost infinite, if you consider it. So if this is exactly at zero, the non-inverting input, then the inverting input has to be extremely small, right? So that the output doesn't saturate. So what we do is, if this is exactly at 0, 0.000 volts, this is going to be like, you know, 0, 0.0001 1 volts. So that even if the gain is extremely high, you still have an unsaturated smooth sinusoidal output, say for example, so that it doesn't saturate, it doesn't look like a square wave. We're trying to avoid this. So what are the points that you have to mention to explain this? You have to talk about the fact that this is earth, you have to talk that uh, talk about the fact that the gain is very high and you don't want saturation. So the value is going to be almost close to zero, so point P becomes a virtual earth, which is this one. All right. So uh, why is point B referred to as virtual earth? The points that you mentioned is that the gain of, gain of an op amp is extremely large and the non-inverting input is at earth, which means it's exactly at zero, right? This is exactly at zero. Uh, so for the output to not saturate, P must be almost equal to zero, which is known as virtual earth. There you go. All right, show that the gain G of an amplifier is given by the expression G is equal to minus R2 by R1. Explain your working. All right, so this is very simple. What we have to do here is we have to assume, number one, that the resistance at this point is extremely high. So if the resistance here is extremely high, whoops. If the resistance at this point is extremely high, so we can assume that there's almost no current in this route from here. So we could say that the current flow through here travels through this. And if it's a feedback loop where this is at a higher potential, then it would travel through this. So basically the current through R2 and the current through R1 are both the same value, right? So that's the first conception that we need. All right, so what is the PD across the current in R1? If we assume this to be almost zero, then we can very easily say that the current here, the current here I is equal to V by R, so it's gonna be V in divided by R1. And for the second one, if we want the current here, then we can very easily say I is equal to uh, V out the PD across this because virtual earth is here and this is V out divided by R2. And we can put a minus here because it's going to get inverted because this is an inverting input. So if we put these together, we can say the current here is the current is here because they're in series. So we get V in by R1 is equal to minus V out by R2. So if this is the case, then we get uh, basically V out by V in is equal to minus R2 by R1. All right, moving forward. So figure 10.1 modified uh, is connected by, modified by connecting LDR as shown in figure 10.2. All right, so if you have an LDR here, what's gonna happen is the feedback resistance is gonna change and based on our equation that we just found out, R2 by R1, the gain of the, uh, the op amp will overall change also. All right, the resistances of R1 and R2 are five kilo ohms and 50 kilo ohms. So this is fixed at five and this is fixed at 50. The input voltage V in is plus 1.2 volts. A high resistance voltmeter measures the output V out. The circuit is used to monitor low light intensities. For that, first of all, we need to find out the feedback resistance. So how much is our feedback resistance gonna be under such conditions? Okay, 100 kilo ohms. So first step one is to find out the feedback resistance here. And uh, that's gonna be 50 kilo ohms uh, at R2 and 100 kilo ohms across the, internal, uh, across the LDR. So if that is the case, then we come up with a resistance of basically how much? Uh, we're going to have 1 by 50 times 10 to the power 3 plus 1 by 100 times 10 to the power 3 to the power minus 1. So this, uh, this is going to give us a value of 33.3 .3 kilo ohms. This is going to be our combined resistance. Right, after we do that, 
What is the gain? Based on the equation that we just figured out, gain is going to be equal to, gain is equal to minus R2 by R1, uh, which is 33.3 .3 divided by 5, which is 6.66. So yeah, minus. And so what is going to be our output? So if the value is 1.2 volts, so it's going to be 6.66 into 1.2. Right, and that gives us an answer total value of 8 volts 6.66 into 1.2 is 8.0 volts if it is 10 kilo ohms. So, we're going to use the same concept in parallel. First, we're going to see how much the total resistance is. The resistance is going to be 8.3 kilo ohms. This is uh, based on like 1 by uh, 50 kilo ohms plus 1 by 10 kilo ohms to the power minus 1. So, 8.33 kilo ohms divided by 5 into 1.2. And that's going to give us the output, which should be 2.0 volts. The light incident on the LDR is provided by a single lamp. Use your answers one to describe, explain qualitatively the variation of the voltmeter reading as the lamp is moved away from the LDR. So this is very easy. What you do is um, basically as the lamp moves further away from the LDR, the intensity of the light falling on the LDR will decrease, right? The further you move, the intensity decreases. So as the intensity decreases, what happens? Uh, basically, as you move further out, the brightness, the resistance will, uh, sorry, the brightness versus the resistance. So the resistance of the across the LDR will increase as the intensity of light falling on it decreases because it's moving away. So this will cause the LDR, uh, the feedback resistance to increase, right? If we go back to the to the question, uh, to the equation, we're going to see that basically the resistance here, if it increases, then the feedback loop's resistance increases, and hence the equation for our gain that's going to be more. So R2 by R1 is going to be greater, and as a result the voltmeter reading will become more negative. In magnitude, it's going to become more, and it's going to become more negative. So that's basically what's going to happen if you move the light away. All right, next question. Distinguish between images produced by CT scanning and X-ray imaging. This is very easy. CT scanning basically uh, does what? You have the X-ray scanner, and it's moving around in a circle, around the patient in circles. So basically what you get is you get multiple uh, slices, right? So you get multiple slices through the patient, and these can be put together to create a 3D image. While in the case of a patient who is doing an X-ray, that's basically like you know an X-ray source, and uh, if you have a tissue and everything, it creates a shadow, right? So that's the fundamental difference between the two. That CT scans are made up of many slices and creates a 3D image, while X-rays are basically shadow 2D images. All right. Then the next question, by reference to the principles of CT scanning, suggest why CT scanning could not be developed before powerful computers were available. So this is pretty much uh, straightforward. So what do we talk about here? So first of all, you have to uh, understand that uh, while CT scanning, what we do is, uh, during CT scanning, what we do is we, we take images from different angles, right? So you take 45 degree angle intervals, and then we take images uh, from multiple angles. So what you say is, um, uh, during CT scan, we take x-rays from multiple angles to create images of slices then uh, like you know we take it we take many images for each slice then what we have to do is we take many slices and then we put these slices together and uh, we we generate what is known as a 3d image right 3d reconstruction because this whole process there's like millions of computations for each slice then again you have many slices and then you have to put all of these slices together to create a 3d image which can then actually be viewed, rotated and viewed from different angles. So this whole thing, this whole 3D generation actually requires a huge amount of processing capability and also you have to store a large amount of data. That's why we need very powerful computers to do it. All right, so we are done with this paper and uh, we'll just go quickly through the mark scheme so that we know that we've, uh, how to answer each one of these and it's gonna be a quick review of the paper. And uh, later on when you wanna revise, you can just watch it from this point. All right, so uh, first of all, the question is gravitational force between a planet and the object. If you go to the scheme here, it's going to be basically the gravitational force of fraction, gmm by r squared. All right, the next question. Centripetal force required to a circular motion on a small mass. It's going to be centripetal force, which is f is equal to mr omega squared. And then we said that the normal reaction force is the difference between the two. Now the difference between the two is going to be gmm by r squared minus mr omega squared. All right. Then explain why the normal force uh, will be a different a different equation at the equator on the poles. That's because the radius is going to decrease, or you can also say that it's no longer perpendicular to each other. So these are the points that you have to say. Expression R is present in the expression R omega square and no longer parallel or normal to the surface. Or you can also say as the object reaches the pole, it is it decreases to eventually zero. 
any of the points. Then we talked about the acceleration when the object is at the equator and the acceleration, acceleration when the object is at one of the poles. So we basically use uh, r omega square, uh, where r is the radius and omega square 8.6 times power 4 seconds that they given, 0 0.034 seconds, and the acceleration at the pole is zero because there's no radius. So just two factors that could be a real planet cause variations in the acceleration of the free fall on its surface. So these are the points that we talked about. Uh, radius of the planet varies. We could say the density of the planet is not constant, the planet is spinning, or there are nearby planets or stars. All right, then, specific latent energy to definition, def uh, they want the definition, thermal energy required to convert unit mass of solid liquid in a normal melting point without any change in temperature, whichever point you can mention it works. Then we saw this, the melting of the ice, uh, switched off for 10 minutes, switched on for 5 minutes. So just why water, uh, mass of water is determined with the heater switched off, so basically to make allowance for heat gains from the atmosphere, all right? So that's when we switch it off for 10 minutes. So this is how we can determine the acid, uh, ice is melting at constant rate. Uh, so yeah, we can count the rate of the drops from the funnel or we can see if the mass is kind of collected per minute in the beaker is a constant value or not. Calculate specific latent to the fusion of ice. So we talked about this. Uh, uh, first of all, you have to break it down into uh, thermal energy provided over five minutes. So Q is equal to ML. So if you do this calculation, Q uh, is 18 kilojoules. M is going to be 56.4 times 10 power minus 3. And L is going to come out as 320 kilojoules per kg. All right. And then we talked about this where we have simple harmonic motion, definition of simple harmonic motion. So the points that they want, acceleration is proportional to the deceleration from the equilibrium point and the acceleration and displacement are always in opposite directions. These are defining points, A is equal to minus mega square x, right? So then the next question, suggest so the position at the point needle time is equal to zero. So it's going to be at the highest point because this is a cross omega t equation. So it's going to be 11 millimeters, sorry, it's going to be 8 millimeters above the cloth or 40 millimeters below the cloth. They allow this because you can also start from the lowest point as one of the extremes if it's a cost graph. Determine the values of A and omega. So A is the amplitude. So it's basically what we said, half of 22 millimeters, which is 11 millimeters. And omega is 2 pi f, which is 28.3 radian per second. All right, calculate for the point uh, for the point of the needle its maximum speed. So this is where you can use the equation uh, so V is equal to omega A. So omega is 28.3 times 10 power, uh, sorry, 28.3, and A, which is the amplitude, 11 times 10 power minus. So you get 0.31 meters per second. Speed as it moves downwards through the cloth. So that's going to be A square minus omega square. Uh, v is equal to omega root, sorry, A square minus Y square, and the value of Y is 3 millimeters. So your answer is going to be 0.3 meters per second. All right, then. Write down equation for the first law of thermodynamics, blah, blah, blah. If you delu is equal to Q plus W. All right. Then, pressure on the ideal gas constant temperature. Explain what the change, what change, if any, occurs in the attempt to internal energy of the gas. So we said that the temperature is constant, so the kinetic energy is going to be constant, and the potential energy is constant because there are no intermolecular forces of attraction, so no change in internal energy. All right. The next question. Uh, so you have two deuterium nuclei moving towards each other and they hit each other. So you need to calculate their kinetic energy for them to approach. So basically this is where you have to explain that the change or loss of kinetic energy is equal to the change in gaining uh, electric potential energy. So you put in the equations for that, half of the square into 2 because 2 particles is equal to Q square. Again, because 2 particles Q square, 2 pi omega uh, 2 pi epsilon naught R. Calculation gives you, you put in the values if you notice here, taking the value of charge square and also uh, we're taking the value of the radius as the diameter because that's half the radius of one, uh, radius of one and the radius of the other together. So if we equal to 2.5 times 10 power 6 meters per second. All right. For a fusion reaction to occur, the deuterium nuclei must come into contact. Assuming the deuterium blah, 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 blah. So here we had to calculate how we come up with the RMS speed and how it's related to temperature. So basically PV is equal to R, NM, half NMC squared and PV is equal to NKT. So we end up with this equation and the temperature that we get once we do substitution of the values properly is 5 times 10 power 8 Kelvin which is extremely high, and this is something that you get in the cores of stars, temperature forming stars. All right, then we talked about a transformer, uh, continuous loop. Um, there's a continuous loop to prevent loss of magnetic flux and improve flux linkage with the secondary. And then we also talked about why is it laminated. It's laminated because it reduces energy loss due to eddy current. All right, Fred is low electromagnetic induction, rate of change of VMS is proportional or equal to the rate of change of flux linkage. All right, use Faraday's law to explain the operation of transformer. Changing a current in the primary coil causes a changing flux in the core, and this flux then passes to the secondary coil, and a changing flux induces an EMF. Easy as that. State two advantages of using alternating voltage for the transmission and the use of electrical energy. Two advantages of the use of alternating voltage. So we talked about how we can prevent line loss, and we also talked about how we can also use transformers to vary voltages easily or efficiently. 
All right, then, the principle of evidence of photoelectric effect, basically particle nature of light, instantaneous emission, presence of threshold frequency, electron energy dependent on frequency, or maximum electric on electron energy not dependent on intensity, and rate of emission depends on the intensity only. Describe briefly the concept of the photon. Photon is basically what? It is a packet of quantum, packet or quantum of energy, electromagnetic energy or radiation. There you go. You can also mention the easy way to explain how lines of emission, blah, blah, blah. So we talk about discrete energy levels. Uh, discrete wavelengths mean the photons have particular energies. Uh, energy of the photon determined energy of the orbital electron. All right. Then the next question. Uh, we have the falls here. So basically they asked you to draw them. And obviously we drew the three. And 486, 656, and 880 nanometers. Calculate the maximum energy change. So basically, we do the calculation using the shortest wavelength, which is 486, because that has the highest energy. So energy change is shown correctly. I was pointing the correction direction, which is downwards, and the wavelengths are correctly identified. So we've talked about that. 486 nanometers, 4.09, 10 to the power minus 19 joules. All right. Then, what is meant by a magnetic field? It is a region of space in which a force is experienced by a kind kind conductor, moving charge, or a permanent magnet. All right. Then state the nature of the field uh, of the field of force on a mass is charge. So this is basically the things that we talked about. The first thing was electric because it's charged. Next was uncharged, so it was gravitational. Then there's a moving charge which is magnetic and it's slowly moving, but in this particular direction which was parallel to the magnetic flux. So that causes it to be magnetic also. All right. Then infrared radiation is used. Why do we use infrared radiation? Because uh, uh, IR is going to lose less energy per unit distance, so basically unit length, so attenuation less, and hence you need fewer repeaters or longer uninterrupted length of fiber optic cable. And then we talked about base stations, which we don't need anymore. Limited range cells do not overlap short wavelength, convenient length of area along the mobile phone. For next, satellite frequency is order of gigahertz, and also the uplink and the different from the frequency of the downlink. So why is this? Large information, that's why we work in gigahertz frequencies, and the uplink and the downlink are different frequency so that it doesn't swamp each other. All right, then question 10. Uh, name the, this type of amplifier. So we saw that the input is the inverting and the other one is earth. So it is an inverting amplifier. All right, then we talked about why point P is virtual earth. The points R, gain of the op amp is very large and the non-inverting input is exactly at zero. So the amp for the amplifier to not saturate, P must also be almost at zero. All right, then. Uh, the equation that we have to derive, this is a very important equation because they've introduced this, reintroduced this into the uh, syllabus. So you have to first mention input resistance is very large. Current R1 and R is equal to the current through R2. And then I is equal to Vn by R1. I is equal to Vout by R2. You can equate the two. And hence gain is equal to Vout by Vn is equal to minus I to R by R1. And we're putting in the minus because it's inverting. All right, then we talked about this, where you do the calculations of the gain for 100 kilo ohms and 10, 10 kilo ohms based on the resistance of the LDR. Very simple calculations, basically blah, blah, blah. One is going to give you a gain of 6.66, you get an output of 8 volts, and the other one gives you an output of 2 volts. All right, then the next question. Light uh, incident on the LDR is provided by a single lamp. Uh, how is it affected when you move the lamp away? So basically, if you move the lamp away, there's a decrease in the brightness of the light. The feedback resistance will increase, and hence the volumeter reading increases or becomes more negative. All right, there you go. And one last question. Distinguish between CT and X-rays. This is very easy. CT is basically thin slices through the structure, and uh, which leads to these slices being added up of high detail, creating a 3D image. This is a three-mark question. You have to mention two points about CT and one point about X-ray. It is a shadow image, which is basically a two-dimensional image. And then why do we need high processing capabilities for CT images? X-ray images of slices taken from many different angles, then these are put together, combined, and then processed. It's repeated for many different slices to build up a 3D image. The 3D image can be rotated and viewed from different angles, and for this to work properly, the computer required the computer is required to store energy, store sorry, information, and process huge amounts of it. So that is why that is that. So yeah, this concludes our discussion of this paper.